Right back here. I uh, hope you've had some good tea and snacks and whatever the case might be. Now we're going on with the second part of these flight traps. Yeah, I know we used to call the wires fly traps, um, and they are. Um, but we're looking more at obstacles as well. So, let's carry on. Obstacles. Uh, just mentioned the three-dimensional world below 150. I said about that. Um, Obstacles can be ground bound or airborne. Don't just think, you know, up to now, we just think, yeah, oh, it's everything on the ground, it's a mast on the ground, stuff like that. But airborne stuff now has become a reality because every farmer and every, um, I won't say bored person, I'm going to say modern uh, techno junkie, is going to have his own little drone. Now, it can be a small drone, can be smigger. But it's not the drone drones that we put into war and stuff like that. It's these place things. But if you look at the, the kilograms of those things, they, it's going to be a bird strike. The problem with this is, is that the solidity of uh, or the mass, concentrated mass, um, that exceeds that of a bird. Okay? So, yeah, that's okay. So be aware of that one. Any protrusion of the aircraft or helicopter can be considered part of the air vehicle. Any protrusions. Now, what I'm saying here, man, if you've got a little antenna sticking out here, if you've got skid sticking out here, if you've got poles, uh, if you've got um, uh, your crop spraying booms out at the bottom, all that kind of stuff, all of that is part of the helicopter. Anything that is attached to the helicopter now is the helicopter. When you do cargo slinging, water uh, uh, buckets, and when you start doing stuff, remember that those things are attached to you. It becomes part of the helicopter. Just, just think of it in that way. And that means if there's any interference here, there's going to be interference here. If there's any interference here, there's going to be interference here. All right? Uh, it's just a mindset change that I want you to think. Uh, only those with a mind. <laughs> okay. I'm going to assume all humans do. Um, now, that human or artificial can make precautionary evasory action, uh, evasive action. What am I saying here? Um, uh, to take evasion, evasive action is actually a cognitive process. Now, yes, I know if the buck runs straight and he sees a big tree, they can swing around the tree. So, those are at the lower level of um, let's say, the ability to avoid. Um, so I wasn't writing this for the animals, okay? So when I'm talking about our environment that we are in, human, and there are artificial things that will. And self-driving is becoming part of it. Self-flying be, is definitely becoming part of it. So, uh, but it's going to take a very long time, if ever for you to get big enough equipment to effectively, uh, let's say, do um, chemical application, do game work and stuff like that. So, so for now, remember a lot of stuff we've tried, um, even anti-poaching we've tried it, and no, it's, it, uh, yeah, you, you need the real deal. So at least for now, okay, so if you don't believe what I'm saying, uh, believe it for now until you are no longer around then the situation might just change and by that time this video will not exist anymore anyway all right all the earth and protrusions from the earth natural or man-made are considered to be threats oh so I said anything that is attached to the air vehicle is the air vehicle everything that is attached to mother earth doesn't matter whether it's natural, like a mountain or a tree that's grown or stuff like that, or if it's man-made, there's a mast or a pylon or whatever the case might be. All right? That. Now, wires are but a specific kind. It's not the only kind of obstacle. We're just putting on one here. Two separate masses cannot occupy the same space. Okay, I've said that before and I've been hammering on that. 
that as, and I said, as we are talking at this moment in place, those objects are already in place. They're already occupying the space. It is you that's going to come afterwards and trying to occupy the same space. Mm -mm. It's not going to work. It, it is uh, scientifically not possible. That, but listen to this. Size of an obstacle matters, but only to the relativity of space occupation. Oh my goodness, what am I trying to say here? Well, you see, something might be small. A wire is a very thin. And if you take that thin part of wire and you make it as wide as the helicopter, then you're looking at a, a very small object, really, and you're looking at a very, uh, an object with much less mass than, than what you are bringing to the party. Um, but here's the thing. When the energies are transformed during the collision, distortion of the softest material will take place to a greater extent than the entity with the most mass. Uh, <laughs> air vehicles by design is less mass per unit volume. Oh, so you have just now said, but the wires and all that says, yeah, no, okay, we will destroy the wire. I understand. We're going to break the wire. But the energy exchange is going to be so that something else on this side is seriously going to break as well. Okay, so uh, this is just mid-air accidents are far less than obstacle collisions, but the mid-airs mid are there. Drones are now becoming a serious obstacle. This meteor strike here, um, it is a meteor strike. Well, that is what the picture said when I uh, googled it. So let's believe Google for a second and say that uh, that will be a very very good um, animation of what a meteor strike will look like. The point is that the meteor being much smaller than the moon or the earth or the planets and so on, there is going to be a phenomenal amount of energy that is going to be expended um, and there is going to be a crater. There's going to be a crater. I understand that. So the big boy is going to have a crater. The small boy, good boy, pff, gone. Actually evaporated in this whole process. So let's look at when we are tackling a mountain with an aircraft. Now, I don't want to refer to this very specific aircraft. I, I know some of you will know which one it is, and I'm not commenting on the aircraft at all. I'm just looking here at this space here has been occupied by the mountain. That's natural. It's not man-made. It's been there um, for probably a few million years. I don't think it might not have been there forever, but long enough to be our forevers. And I need you to get this in your mind just to say, listen, guys, it does not allow two masses to occupy the same space at the same time. Right now, there's going to be these physics junkies and they're going to say to me, yeah, but this is possible and this. I'm not looking at the molecular and uh, proton and neutron and all that. And if you want to go into that, it's fine. Go and look at the, in CERN, they've got the particle accelerators and then you go and look. And even, what are they doing with these particles? They are so small, we can't even see them. And they collide them. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Even at that speed and at that size, they can't occupy the same space. There is something. There's an energy transfer and, well, it actually can make stuff because there's so much energy in it. Okay, never mind that. Let's go on. Wire distance due to the wire strands. Uh, almost it's against the sky and no depth perception. So, don't Pylons are the thing. Diameter of the wire such that it doesn't give you a depth. Only by looking at the line, and here I'm saying pylons again because that's a word I'm used to, but if you want to say that's the wire masts, it's the same thing. So it can be a telephone pole mast, and then as they get bigger, we start calling them pylons, and you can call them what you like. It doesn't matter. They're big and they're nasty, but they can be seen. But if you just to height, if you just at that height, where it does not etch against the skyline, 
then it actually disappears and there is a possibility now I've seen that many, you know some of these things are made of wood and they've got in this brown background and you actually cannot see the stuff until you're very close hey there's a, a, a all right it can be too late to pull up so really to transit below 200 feet already is senseless but below 200 feet it becomes stupid senselessness if there is such a, uh, a thing but it's seriously irresponsible get up get out of the way and relax where you're going when we're going to do work we know we're going to fly low and then we we know that we have to pay attention will stuff then still happen yes of course but we've got a big or a much better chance even when hovering close to wires one should have pylons determine the, the precise um, uh, uh, line that is taken up um, two reasons for wire strikes now before I get to the wire strikes I want to note here on uh, this picture here you can see that it's got a wire cutter on here on the UE but you will see that it, it still caused a lot of damage it, it didn't necessarily slip up and then were cut. I think uh, it broke off probably before it got to the wire cutter. Now, most of us don't have wire cutters on. This is just to show you the effect of the sun. The wires disappear completely. They, they're just not there anymore. But the, the main reason why we fly into wires is because they are there. All right. And, uh, okay. So now everybody say, oh, okay. <laughs> that is, no. The fact is, I have now said it repeatedly in this presentation that as we are speaking, they are already occupying the space. Do not intrude where the space has already been occupied. Simple statement, straightforward. Then obviously we, not un we are totally unaware of the, the wires in the flight path. That... Uh, means we're not expecting wires no proper scan pattern could be distractions outside the cockpit distractions inside the cockpit there's a breach of sterile cockpit environment you say what is the sterile cockpit i mean well, i'm not flying a little bit of you know antiseptic with me no no that's not what sterile and it doesn't mean that the pilot has been sort of you know looked after it's got nothing to do with it it means in an, in an, uh, like when the approach is started then there are no nonsense being spoken in the cockpit or with anybody else we concentrate on what we're doing so chit chat and that's what I'm talking about sterile means that whatever happens in the cockpit is directly related to the task at hand right and now so on approach we're not going to talk about your girlfriend on approach, we're not going to talk about the beers. All right. Okay. Three-dimensional world, numinate flow rate. The flow rate of information in the three-dimensional world is infinitely higher than in the two-dimensional higher. Wow. Isn't that a little bit dramatically said, infinitely? Well, there's no way in measure... The amount of stuff that we've got in the 3D environment with the environment where we've got clouds and thunderstorms, that's all. It's, it's a lot if they're there. It's one hell of a problem. Okay? I'm not playing that down. We can get that stuff in the three-dimensional world as well. But there are so many other obstacles and so many other things to do. So low-level flight um, should be treated as advanced flying and task-orientated. Not just, I am quickly going to do this, because it might be quickly over. All right. False hypotheses such as what is it? It's a difficult thing because you can't judge the height. You need differentiation of heights for your eyes to be able to pick it up and remember that the world only exists in your mind you say yep Charlie are, are you crazy man the really the world outside there exists I agree with you it exists 
how it exists depends on how you see it. Uh, okay, uh, when we all look at the same picture and we see the same mountain, then we see the same mountain. I agree with you. But we don't see all the things on the mountain and we don't concentrate on the same things. So there are things that we miss. I will miss that, but you won't miss it. You will miss that. You will miss that. You will miss it. So that which you have missed is not in your mind anymore. If it's not in your mind, it does not exist in your world. The problem is it still actually exists in the real world. So I looked and I saw no wires. So they don't exist in your perceptive world. The sorry fact is that in the real world, it actually do. And that's our problem. Okay. Common reasons, safety attitude. <laughs> I always just want to say, man, your attitude sucks. And this time, all right, let's get back to it. Safety altitude. In other words, we must first reach the height. In other words, we want to go to the category one. We really want to be above 200 feet. The approach path the approach gate establishment. Now the VFR approach gate is um, aircraft in configuration, final approach 500 feet above the ground, going for the landing. Is that for a helicopter as well? Well you see they don't differentiate between the two. I you don't differentiate between the two. And operationally you will say to me, yeah but you know I never fly that high because you know I'm, I'm a game. Yeah I know so you're going to be a hundred feet. Fine then remember there is still an approach path yeah but i just zip it in you can call it and you can zip it as much as you like that is still an approach path and if something is in the way in that approach path you're going to zip into it okay so just think about it head uh, in the cockpit um, that is a bit of problem remember we said heads out only for that distractions those are there attention grabbers and those, remember when we work, it's this guy, it's that, it's that, that. There's a ton of things that's taking your attention, external of the cockpit and internal of the cockpit. Internal of the cockpit is a big problem because that takes your eyes away and the ability to be able to um, get information that is being processed, you're taking that away. So if you're outside, but now if you just start focusing on that one uh, Eland uh, bull that doesn't want to react the way that you wanted to react and you get so focused, you wake up in the hospital. Uh, that's what happened there. All right. Scanning of the flight path. Scan for clues. Not wires. Scan for clues. There's a lot of clues. Why is that an open air? Oh, there's a mast on it. Why is that? Why is that? Thinks that is unnatural, but look for the clues. Oh, th there I can see a pole, but uh, 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 yeah, there, there must be a telephone wire. Where is oh, there's a pole. The fact that the telephone wire has been taken off a long time ago and it doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. You're going to act as if there is until you operate in that for a long time. Then you're going to say, okay, I, I know this, there, there aren't any wires there. Be very careful to get uh, too relaxed in that um, environment. Light conditions, again, low level flight into the sun. Visibility, one must look, one must look to see, then process, then respond. And I'm going to talk about that just now. Lack of sortie preparation, that is just taking it together. Um, this is, uh, if it's not sad, it actually could have gone as cute. I don't know. All right. Uh, a lot of spraying going on here. It's definitely down at the bottom here. We've got some stuff. I don't know what the smoke is all about. Um, okay, but the photograph just looks so fancy that I took it. And I'm using it now. So let's see. Preventative measures. Expect wires to be there. In the modern world, you expect there to be wires period fly lowly even when required study in charts reconnaissance of the extended maneuvering area at high altitude 
talk to pilots, proper cockpit management, proper low-level flight procedures, no compromise to discipline, intentional flight underneath, wires must be properly planned. Yes, is there such a thing as intentional flying below? Yes, there are. There, there are certainly cases where it might be needed. Uh, the thing is now, are you going to discover it by yourself or can I teach it to you? Um, but if I teach it to you, are you going to use it? You know, what's the discipline? And this is one of those catch-22 ideas. Um, if you're a, a game pilot, specifically, um, I think it's, it's good that one looks at the procedures that should one have to go underneath, that must be followed. And remember, the first time in an area is the most dangerous times. After that, when you know the limitations, things can speed up a little bit. Probably said too much about that one already. Okay, there is a NATO standard. Look here, I say what you see is only your perception of reality and the real, real world outside could be changed. So now I'm trying to make, well, I'm, I hope I'm successful in making this a possibility. Uh, okay, before we go, uh, I also love the, the blue eyes here at the bottom. Okay, so let's just, I don't want to take your attention away from the blue eyes at, um, at this stage. So let's look at the sequence. If there's an expectation, then you see stuff and then you perceive. And there could be a delta, a difference between what you expected and what you get. But there can also be a delta between what you perceive things to be and what is real. Okay. I don't want to get into the philosophy, are we living in the matrix and all that kind of stuff. No. We are beings which use our superior capability of making sense of our awareness and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, if I expect there to be a wire and I can see the wire, then I can avoid the wire. If I don't expect the wire, it will come as a surprise. If I haven't got enough space to maneuver away from the same space that the wire is occupying, I am in trouble. But if I do not see something, why would it bother me? Okay? So you cannot avoid that which you do not see. Then I just said here on the side, what I expect then, what I get is my perception, and then it's my perception versus reality. That which you do not see does not make part of your reality and as far as you're concerned does not exist. Wow! So doesn't it really exist? No, it really exists, but it doesn't matter because in your mind it doesn't exist. And now you, in your mind what does not exist and the real what exists is going to now occupy the same space. Problem. Okay. Let's have a look at we fly by. Now, please, um, this is, I, I wanted a dramatic more that you can see that, yes, the main thing that we fly by is sight. And I gave it that huge figure of 95% and it can actually be more. Whether you're sitting at 35,000 feet or whether you're sitting at 5 feet above the ground, up there you're going to be very interested in what your gauges are telling you and and, 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 and your radars and all that kind of stuff. And outside you're going to be very aware what's around there. And say, hey, hey, but I, I, I feel, I mean, I, I just feel it and I just feel it. You can fly by the seat of your pants if you are visual. Flying by the seat of your pants when you're in an instrument flight condition is a myth. It does not exist. Yeah, but who sits there? I'm telling you now, go and ask anybody with a little bit more than one sense at all, that there is no such thing as flying by the seat of your pants when it comes to instrument flying. Period. 
I, I suggest you better believe that. Seeing. But seeing in an instrument condition is now you've only got your instruments and you're not trained to use these things properly. You're going to lose that aircraft. You've got about a minute and a half. And then you would have signed your own death warrant. Hey, come on, Charlie. That's a bit dramatic. I like it. I like it to be dramatic. Because normally the accident is quite dramatic. Okay. So what am I saying here? I'm saying, I'm trying to get into your mind that seeing is the main thing. You become mainly aware about your situation through sight. Not through the feeling. The only feeling that you can talk about is six things. I felt uncomfortable. Oh, well, you know, the first time I take you for an aerobatic sortie, you're going to feel uncomfortable anyway. Does it mean you're going to fly by feeling, no, you got nothing. But you can see. All right. Um, hearing. Now I panned it down, and it is probably too high the hearing, but what is it that we can hear? We can hear engine noises change and stuff like that. Is that going to be strong enough? I think if you fly long enough and that has become part of your how you synchronize with your machine. I'm flying the same helicopter every day and I can hear the revs change. That's great. It's great use. Smelling? Well, I just say one of that's by exception. Yeah, you can smell smoke and you can yeah and there's but the physical ability to fly, number one, is sight. Then you get that into your mind and you've got to do something with it. Feeling? Oh, I can feel the stick shaker and I still, yes, but remember those are things that you feel when you're really in trouble. It's because when you didn't pay attention that eventually you will feel maybe a little bit of chudder and, but what are you going to see? I'm going to see the VSI is now going to slam down. That means I'm in a stall. I'm going to, I can see inside the speed is low. How fast are you going? Well, I've got to look on the dial, my man. Yes. All right. So, I don't know how to say it more, but stop relying on all the other other things because uh, I've got my GPS and I've got my cell phone and that's all I need. Ah, I understand they are brilliant stuff to help you, but they are not taking the place of your eyes. We are not there yet. Artificial intelligence is not... Well, I know that Elon Musk has now got self-driving cars and that will definitely be the future. And probably in 15 to 20 years from now, it's not going to be the in thing to drive anymore. Of course, there's going to be no need to drive anymore. There's probably going to be no need to fly anymore, physically. But somebody will still have to, if it's a, a predictable, predictable environment and believe me the road is far more predictable than the sky far more predictable the sky is just one of those very very unpredictable can immediately change but there's a lot of artificial intelligence already working in it can sense it can see it can make a decision to go this way around the storm or that way the storm those things up or down or what it can already give those inputs for now, it may be a suggestion, but on autopilot, aircraft can, can handle it by itself, actually. Okay? But when we are amongst the trees, there's no way. Not for now, and not for a long time. So, in our lifetime, where we are now, not 50 years in the future, as I said, then probably this video might not even exist anymore. Or it might not be, um, but it is relevant in today's and uh, times and with what we are still working, maintaining straight and level. I say when, when an, a, a wire strike is eminent, uh, straight, straight and level. No, there are people that say that you must bank the helicopter so that you can cut the wires. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how many wires you're going to cut. If there's one, hmm, okay, maybe. And if there's two or three, I... I don't think you'll be able to cut through all of them. And remember when you get to the very high tension wires, these thick boikies, they might not even be, you won't be able to cut through them. Okay, let's not argue about that part. Uh, advising at this stage, if it's imminent and you can't pull uh, or you can't dump 
in a helicopter and go below or in an aircraft you can't push forward and go low or higher, then wings level. Okay. You present as little profile to the strands. That's the basic idea. Avoid any abrupt maneuvers. Uh, helicopter guys, you can cut the tail off the helicopter and, 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 and. Normally, by nature, we're going to try and avoid. Okay. Uh, but I'm just saying this. Land as soon as possible. And sometimes people have a wise track and then they, oh, okay, it's, uh, it still feels fine and we go. Huh? Land. Shut down. Inspect. All right? Yeah, I had a wire strike, but I didn't think it was so bad. Um, you need a slap, my man. All right, never mind. Okay. In conclusion, you cannot avoid which you do not. Now, I don't know if you can see the C in there. Uh, there, it, there is a word saying C. So, say you cannot avoid that which you do not see. There's the flight path direction. There is still one wire left. You can see it there. Let me just clear it up for you. You can still see that one wire there. I'm going to clear it up again. And um, you can see these wires had no problems. It was only one or two of the, and then here you will find the wreckage. Is this to scare the bejeevers out of you? No. It's to say, do the SOP. The standard operating procedure represents the truth. The truth as we know it. Okay? We write standard operating procedures for now. We write low-level procedures, how we do game doing, how we do uh, uh, aerial application, and, 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 and. They're, well, if there's no standard operating procedure, you're going to do it in a happy-go-lucky fashion. And maybe you make it, maybe you don't make it. All right. The whole idea of this thing is that there must be no maybe. We want you to get one piece on the other side. Then there's no guarantee, okay? I have said that also many times before. But you assure us all are going to be have a better chance of survival because survival at the end of the day is what it's all about. It like, makes me think of that one Atwood said, but, but, but it jumped in front of me. Now, there, there can be times. The tree jumped in front of me or the wires, you know, just whatever. All right. And I'm saying that maybe in a joking way, but to say that um, stuff happens. True. Understand that. And... I get that, but what I need you to get is that you take the SOP, you apply it, you've got infinitely more chance of surviving. I'm not saying that you will survive, but there is a damn fine chance that you will. So, what can I say? Plan, and remember that which you do not see. So, look Outside, plan and get to expect and then to become aware in time, happy safe flying.